brutal. Our 16th president was falling into a deep depression as every week the war became more complicated. His days were discouraging and his nights were what seemed to him to be interminably restless, only to awake the next morning to another horrible report of more deaths, more heartbreak, and the future ending of it all seemed forever, forever removed from him. Would it ever end? The burden of all of that rested on the shoulders of uh, Mr. Lincoln, and we who love to read him and of him stand back in amazement at his ability to handle it as well as he did. One afternoon, he felt he just must get a little solitude and hopefully find a place of refreshment and relief. He said to his aide, I'd like to go to the, to the church, National Presbyterian Church. And the two of them went alone, walked there. That was in the days when presidents could walk freely in the capital city. And night had fallen. They slipped into a side door to an unlit room so as not to call attention to his presence and disturb the meeting. The pastor had just stood to begin to preach. Lincoln crossed his legs, placed his stovepipe top hat on his lap, and never moved as he listened intently to what the pastor had to say. As the sermon ended, uh, people got up to leave, and he remained seated, and his aide leaned over and whispered to him, well, what did you think? Did you think it was a good message? He said, I, I thought the message was well prepared, well delivered, sincere. The points were logical. The man was clear. Then you thought it was a good sermon? No, I thought he failed, said the president. Failed? How? Why? He failed because he did not ask of us something great. I thought about that uh, story and I thought about that fact. On many occasions, I thought about it this morning on my way in to the seminary. I don't want to fail today in that one area, and I don't think I will because I have his word that asks of all of us something great. You're sitting here uh, this morning, most of you are students at the school, you're engaged in your studies, you are in some phase of those studies, some of you nearer graduation uh, than others, some of you have just begun. I think I probably speak for most of you when I say, unfortunately, that you really don't ever see yourself engaged in something great. We've been taught very well to do the little things well, and we should. To be faithful behind the scenes, and there's everything right about that. To cover the bases, to become the wind beneath another's wings to stand along them and, if necessary, in their shadow and do the work that God's called us to do with the training he's given us. And as a result, 
The last place most of you see yourself is in a great place. A place of, of sizable significance. Where your life touches many people. It may be in a church. It may be in another culture. Through another language. It may even, it may even be someday serving as a, as a professor at a seminary or a Bible school or some other educational institution. But whatever it is, as you've told yourself over and over, I, I want to be faithful in, in the little things. I want to do what God would have me do, and I applaud that, and I commend you for that. But I warn you, you may have forgotten, though I don't plan to speak on it, that the prayer of Jabez was a prayer filled with faith. Do something great through me, God. And as he asked that, he asked it with, with humility. Not to make a name for himself or a place where they'd remember him, but he just prayed that he would be able to live above and beyond what had been his life and the past, what seems to have been somewhat broken. But the person I have in mind is going to surprise you because he never, ever at this time in his life thought, he would ever be in a place of greatness where God would do something great through him. He's an 80-year-old Bedouin under the burning sun of the Median Desert in the shadow of Sinai. And there Moses stands alongside his sheep, really not even his own sheep, but his father-in-law's sheep. For 40 years, he has worked for his father-in-law, Jethro. For 40 years, he has led the sheep in the wilderness. He's 80. I almost know how he felt. I almost know. This year in October, I will know a little more how he felt. But, but he, he saw himself as finished. I mean, he left he left Egypt as a fugitive with a criminal record. He was a murderer. Took things in his own hands, attempted to rescue the people from their bondage and murdered an Egyptian, remember, and hid him in the sand. And, and they were out for him and, and, and he fled, wound up far as away as he could get where he ultimately met and married his wife and settled in for a life to be forgotten. I don't know where you are in your own brokenness, but we all know something of those feelings. You've made a mess of some things. Your past is, uh, is maybe checkered. Uh, perhaps you're not the brightest uh, bulb in the room. And uh, you're, you're surrounded by others who are very, very capable academically. I know that feeling. Uh, I was accepted to seminary on probation. And that was with reluctance. And I remember while here and, 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 and serving uh, one of my first uh, tasks here, I became the, the lawn man. And I... I mowed the grass and planted the flowers, and, and uh, that's how I got to know the president. By the way, I didn't know this was his favorite hymn, but Dr. Walford loved flowers. And I thought, shoot, I'm planting a lot of those suckers around here. And <laughs> I did. Amazingly, they lived. So he, he finally, I think, one hot summer afternoon said, you're, you're a student here. And I said, yes, sir. I am. What's your name? I told him. And he said, 
Well, I'm John Walford, as if I didn't know, you know. I, <laughs> the world knows you. Uh, but I was a nobody who came from nothing, raised in El Campo, Texas. You'll spend a while trying to find it. It's tucked away down there in South Texas. And here I was, a student, never in my life ever did I think there would be much that would come as a result of my studies here. Whatever God planned was fine with me. Whatever it was was grace. Moses is in a predicament, and he knows it. The best thing to do, he thought, was to hide out. Let me pass along to you three mistakes that I think broken people make. And uh, after I give those to you, I'll do a quick breezy journey through this battle he has at the burning bush. And then I'll tie it with a couple of thoughts. People who are broken often run before they are sent. It's a tendency on the part of the intense type person to jump ahead, to get engaged, to be involved. All the way through my years at seminary, I was surrounded by students who would say to me, you need to be on the campus. You need to be out evangelizing. You need to be pastoring a church. I thought, who, who are they talking to? I'm here to learn. I'm here to, I'm here to get some training. I don't know how to do all of that. Uh, some of them were. and They were engaged in that. Wasn't time for me to run before I was sent. I had no calling to do that. I was here, and I gave it the very best I could during those four years. The second mistake that's made is that we retreat after we have failed. We, we run before we're sent. And then often in the running and the doing of it in the flesh, frequently we fail. And we're embarrassed, we're humiliated. Maybe some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have failed, and as a result, your tendency is to retreat. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, and in the shadows, I'll try to make it as best I can. And the third, we resist when we are called. I fear that most for most of you. In God's plan, which has been in motion since eternity past, he said, you in mind, he has a future for you and a hope, a plan that will unfold. And right now, you don't have a clue. Some of you think you do, but you really don't know ultimately how or where he will use you. I plead with you to stay open because I can assure you it will include some surprises. Moses was in for the surprise of his life when he came upon a bush that wouldn't stop burning. Burning bushes in that Median desert were not that unusual, or in any desert for that matter. But a bush that wouldn't be consumed by the flame that was unheard of, which caused him to look at the fire and say, this is amazing, Exodus 3, verse 3, why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see it. Now, you understand, he's never read Exodus 3. So, so he does not know that God is in the bush. He doesn't know that's where the voice of God will be heard. And I'm sure one of his first thoughts was when he heard his name, Moses, Moses. First thought was he found me. I'm not sure they were on speaking terms. We know nothing of his spiritual walk for 40 years. I mean, we have this image of Moses that is just phenomenal. 
I mean, born in this privileged family. He wasn't privileged. Swam the Nile when he was a baby. He didn't swim the Nile. <laughs> Grew up, looked like Charlton Heston. He didn't. That's, that's not Moses. It's not Moses. Stephen does tell us he's mighty in words and deeds. I think he had a chest full of military medals. He was supremely significant to Pharaoh, who probably had his eye on him as a replacement until he blew it. And now Moses, 80 years old, nothing but memories, and they're fading. And he hears Moses, Moshe, Moshe. In the Hebrew, it's a simple little response. Hineni. Don't even have to put your lips together to say it. Behold, it's me. Hineni. I'm Moses. Who are you? Don't come any closer. The Lord warned, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. I'm the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I can hardly read it. I can't imagine the thrill that must have coursed through him. He hasn't forgotten me. He still knows me. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. When you read your Bible, may I urge you not to rush through moments like this. When there is an emotional moment, give it some emotion. Let it be relived in your minds. Put yourself in his place. Now sandals off. Now on the, on the hot sand. Now in front of the bush that keeps burning and keeps talking. Feel it. He covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord asks of him something great. Does he ever? I'll cut to the chase. Verse 10. Now. Go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. <clears throat> Remember we resist when we're called when we're broken. Pharaoh. My picture's still in the post office. <laughs> I'm a wanted man down there. The last place I want to go. They hate me there. See, all these years, he's had time to relive it. And over the passing of time, your imagination runs wild where you have failed. And you, you smeared that like a slab of peanut butter across toast. You smeared that across your life. That's, that's you. You're the personification of failure. You blew it. First words out of the bush for the call was go. All right. We'll pause there and let that one sink in. Whenever the Lord uses you in any, any measure for whatever purpose, you go from here to there. Unless his call is that you remain right here for further study. And, and you're, you're going, oh, man, that's the last thing. Well, hang on. <laughs> you may be the Ph.D. student of the future. And you'll be the most surprised. Because some of you are thinking, Ph.D.? <laughs> Just let me get out with whatever. I, I am not coming back. Don't say not doing that. Half of these guys would say the same thing. Who knows but what his plan is for you to be in front of a class and to shape the lives of those who will be going where you will never go. What a calling. But that's, that's their calling. That may not be yours, but it'll be 
going somewhere. Going where? Away from the familiar, which is what makes something great so difficult. Forgive the frequent personal illustrations. I just don't know anybody else better than I know myself. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, every calling I've had has been surprising. Every one I said no to, to begin with. Every single one, sometime, several times. I was graduating the seminary. I had offers to go to different places. And of all people, Dr. Pentecost asked me to be his assistant. First response was, <laughs> uh, me? And then it was, no, I... What is to think about it? I'd like you to think about that. So I did that for a while. And uh, in the middle of that, the Lord had another plan for us. It was to go to New England. Who in his right mind <laughs> is going to leave Texas to go to New England? I know if you're from New England, you're offended by that. Get over it. So I go, and, and I, I'm the most surprised guy in New England. I, I told him, no, no, I'm, that's not for me. That's not where I ought to be. Uh, New England's not only a geography, it's a way of life, which I never, I, I never really got. So I wasn't there very long. It, I would call it pretty much a failure. But it wasn't a mistake. I just had to learn what it meant to fail. And I did. I don't think all of them there that were in that church would say I failed, but it wasn't the kind of place that, you know, exciting, you know, from one day to the next. Uh, I mean, it snows there. <laughs> it's starting to snow here a lot. What's the matter with that? Anyway, to my surprise, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, I, I, I want you back in Texas. And I said, no, I'm not going back there. I've, I've been there all my life. And all oh, you need to go back there. No. So my wife heard, okay, Lord, I got it. Um, I'm on the phone, and she's so anxious to leave. She said, I'll tell you what, honey, you pray about this while I pack. Okay. Yeah. So we wound up in Irving, came to Irving, a little church. And of all things, I follow Stan Toussaint. How bright is that? Uh, and uh, while I'm there, it's amazing how God blessed it. Just had the time of my life. And we had a number of seminary students with some of the faculty members that were coming to the church. It was just great. Built a new building and exciting. And the day my mother died, I got a letter from California. February 1971. Uh, and they wanted me to think about coming to a church out in California. No. No. First of all, I'm grieving and got to prepare the funeral message for my mother. This is I mean, it's the most ill-timed letter that was ever written. They wrote again, please think about it. No. I, I'm where I ought to be. We're just getting, just been here just four years and I really want to get at it. Well, then they wrote again. They said, What's wrong with these people? And uh, uh, Cynthia said, you know, we really don't have any business leaving. I, I know, honey, I know. I'm not asking for it. I'm just, they won't quit writing. And so I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go out there, and I'll, I'll go to the seminar I wanted to go to here. Then on Sunday, I'll go preach out there, and I'll come back here and done. And uh, I went, and oh, it was fantastic. Hate to tell you how much fun we had. And uh, so I came back and she met me. Okay. <laughs> she met me at the, uh, at, the, at the airport, you know, like this. <laughs> I don't want to hear. Anyway, long story short, of all places, this Texan goes to California. Never been there in my life except when I did an internship with Ray Stedman up in Palo Alto. I'm telling you all of this so you'll know something of the surprise things that happened. Not one of them did I pursue, did I seek. Not one of them was I looking for. And it's like, 
I can't believe it. I, I didn't know the geography. I didn't know the lifestyle. We had four kids. One wasn't even a year old. The other one was nine. They were all little. Every Texan told us that they're, you're going to lose your family if you move to California, which that's a crock. I don't know why people say things like that. Uh, you don't lose your family unless you lose your family. It's not the environment. It's, it's the home. And it, it's challenging, but what's, what else is life but a challenge? You think it's all that great shakes here in Texas for the kids? I mean, it, it's a challenge everywhere. So we go out there, and I, I'm telling you, hang on, city. It is really an experience. I never had a multiple staff before, and now I have to. I started with no staff, and I hired every one of them. Little by little along the way, it was a time when Orange County was exploding and our church grew. We wound up with, couldn't handle all the services, five on Sunday, five services every Sunday. People sat on the floor, in the aisle, under the piano. The only one we tried to keep out was the, was the fire marshal. I didn't want him to know what we were doing in there. It was, <laughs> broke all the rules. We brought in extra chairs. We had uh, television, uh, closed circuit television. We finally, let's, we left a build. Now, I didn't want to go through, I'd gone through a building program at Irving. I don't want to go through one again. And, and you know, that's what happens. They pull you and, 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 and we built a building and it filled up. Having the time of my life, almost 25 years. So I'm telling you where the Lord sends you, it is remarkable what can happen to you. And you finally are at peace with it. You say yes to it. And you do it. And having done it, you realize how, how magnificent the plan is. He, he wanted to do great things. And I want to do familiar things. He wanted to break molds. And I wanted to pour, be poured into the mold where I am comfortable. Where I know all the streets and where the restaurants are. And where the grocery stores are. And all. I go out there and... And, I mean, those places, those things out there change about every third month, and you're on the move. It's a fast lane, and before long, could, would you believe it, God opens up doors for a publishing ministry. I never dreamed of writing a book, ever, in my years at this school. I sat in awe of those profs that taught me and were using their texts, and I'm thinking, what would that be like? Can't imagine. Now I've got a publishing thing going. And out of the blue, I have a man named Al Sanders who says, I think you ought to think about being on the radio. And I said, I don't, I, I don't need to be on the radio. That, that's ridiculous. I never listen to radio. Uh, I certainly don't listen to it. I, I certainly don't listen to Christian radio. And he says, I know. Uh, we, we, need, we need to give them something to listen to. I thought, well, no, I'm still not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I didn't have anybody to lead it. I didn't know how to do it. I don't know that medium. Uh, I know preaching. I know a little bit about the church. And that's, that's, the, that's my rut. That's my thing. And, and God broke a mold, opened up a ministry for the, the, the media. I never dreamed of that. People ask at times, is this all a big fulfillment? No, as a matter of fact, it's all a big surprise. I live my life surprised. I'm amazed when people listen when I talk. Well, most do. Not everybody. And I'm, I'm, I'm just shocked at the audience God gives us. We're going to Israel tomorrow. Oh, I got a pack. I forgot that. Anyway. Um, I'll be, I'll, I'll have it. 820 people. 18 buses. All aboard. Get on. Let's go. I had never been to Israel until I came to Dallas Seminary, and then I suddenly realized what I've been missing. Now I have a chance to lead a tour every other year. What a privilege that is. Listen to me. They got their Bibles, and they're looking at the places, and they're thinking about how great this is. And We're on the Sea of Galilee, my favorite spot. You know why I like it? They can't build a church on it. I like it. You know, they, they can't make it religious. It's just water and the shore and the beauty of it and the significance. And you get people there that have never been in their life and they fall back in love with Jesus. How good is that? 
me, El Campo Yo-Yo, leading this marvelous opportunity. And I'm all settled in. Everything's great. We're going along, you know, year after year. And I get a call from Dallas Seminary. Sounds a lot like Don Campbell's voice. And I thought, well, maybe I'm in trouble again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, Jack Turpin is the chair of the board at the time. And he said, uh, we'd like you to think about being president. Is this a joke or what? <laughs> I don't think they've ever been asked that in their life. Is this a joke? And, I, and they said, no, we'd like you to really seriously. I said, no. What's the matter with you people? <laughs> the first time I was there, I was on probation. You ought to see what it would be like if I became president. <laughs> and they would not give up. And then Jack had the audacity to say, would you pray? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll pray. My wife is saying, I think it's a good idea. I'm thinking, whose side are you on? <laughs> this is how this works. You think it's all spiritual and incredibly life-changing and all that. And it, whoa, 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 angels drift around on It isn't. It's, so whose side are you on? Well, I'm trying to listen to God. Well, you're out of luck. I'm not the one. Either. And she's right. It drives me crazy. <laughs> so I wind up here, and I realize when I'm here. They didn't need another scholar, certainly didn't get one with me. What they needed was a shepherd, somebody to tell these people, I love you, you're valuable. And somebody who understands a student who can hardly keep up, stumbles over the languages and, 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 and tries your best to keep on a level plane. I understand that. You want to quit, I understand. Your wife gets sick. I understand that. Or your husband. We lost a, a baby here. About finished us off. I understand that. So I come as a shepherd. And I have a chance to, to be with some people of whom the world is not worth. Now I realize that's what God had in mind. And uh, one of my favorite stories is when, when I finally had finished my calling here and we were in a church out in the little town of Frisco. I used to hunt dove in Frisco. That's a dump, you know, back when I was here before. And now it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's just growing like topsy. And we got a church right in the nerve center of all of that. And, and I'm thinking, God has a great sense of humor. Here I, here I am in the, in the middle of this growing church. I've never started the church in my life. No. But it was yes, yes, yes. So learn from me. Stop saying no. Stop looking at the obstacles. Stop thinking, not me. So Moses protested to God and said, verse 11, Who am I? You're nothing. Could have been the answer. Who am I that I appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? You happen to be a human set of vocal cords, and that's all I need. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who, to Jesus, have fled. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, cause you to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. You're a set of vocal cords, but I am God. Now get out of the median desert. Resign the job of 
Pharaoh of, of, of Jethro's assistant and take on Pharaoh. Well, what should I tell them? Isn't that like we all want to know those things ahead of time? They're going to ask me, what is the name of the one who called me here? What will I tell them? Tell them me I am called you. He'll get that. <laughs> and you know, he did. He isn't through. What if they won't believe me or won't listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? <laughs> we got that when we left Irving. Well-meaning lady stuck her head in the window of our car. We're on our way to California. And she said, she was really angry because we were leaving, and she said to Cynthia, you know, the Lord gets blamed for a lot of things he has nothing to do with. <laughs> so I won't tell you my first Marine Corps response uh, in the car. I just said to Cynthia, roll the window up. So she backed away and rolled the window up, and we drove off. And I said, honey, if you think about that, the rest of the trip to California is going to ruin the beginning. She just can't see past the nose on her face. She doesn't realize. We're not going because we're just craving to get out of here. We're going because we can't stay. Get that. And you can't expect them always to get it. Folks won't understand. Very few will go, oh, you're in trouble. They all go, good. Get out. This is great. They will want you to stay if you've done what you should have been doing. But God doesn't wait for you to finish everything he starts. What if, what if, what if, and finally, Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and that's where he, his memory failed him. Because he was mighty in words and deeds when he was 40. But when you follow sheep for 40 years, it's down to bad. Your vocabulary tends to. I'm not, I'm not very good with words. And, and, and then he said, uh, Lord, please send anyone else. Man, I've, I've prayed that. I've said that. Lord, just send anybody else. I don't want to do that. I'm not calling you because you want to do it. I'm calling you because I want you to do it. Would you please say yes? I'm asking of you something great. You know what most folks don't read? They don't read the end of chapter 4. Think about how Moses felt when this happened. Listen. Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt, called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses. Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. Now listen. Then the people of Israel were convinced the Lord had sent Moses and Aaron. Look at that. The people were convinced. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. And flat on his back, worshipping, or maybe on his face, Moses realized why the bush never burned up. <laughs> you see it all so much later. I'm asking of you something great. This message is not going to be a failure. I'm asking you to think yes. I'm asking you to be available. I'm asking you to learn from my frequent no, no, no. as a wrong response when the Lord is on the other end of that phone call. Or when he brings before you something that you hadn't planned on. You're not in charge of your life. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. We're vessels to be filled and used. So get out of the way. Say yes. One by one, God took them from me. All the things I valued most till I was empty-handed. Every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highways grieving in my rags and poverty until I heard his voice inviting, lift those empty hands to me. So I 
lifted my hands toward heaven and he filled them with a store of his own transcendent riches till they could contain no more. And at last I comprehended with my stupid mind and dull that God couldn't pour his riches into hands already full. Get just enough training to be effective then get out of the way. Empty the hands. Open the mind. Think yes. He's going to use some of you in greater ways than you nor I together could ever imagine. It's coming. Dear Lord God, thank you for continuing to work in my life in such a way that, that I realize more and more how absolutely insignificant I am in this whole process. I got a voice, and I, I've got a, a body, and I've got a mind, and I've got a mouth, and I've got a, a family, and, and you, you're wanting to use different parts of that at different times and keep me from making a mess of what you're planning to do. And I pray the same for those men and women who've listened so well today. Guard us all, our Father, from building those great big barriers based on a human viewpoint that thinks and says repeatedly, no, 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 no. No, no, not me, no. And then let's learn from Moses, Lord, that uh, the only way to go is, is with a yes. And then help us get out of the way. So I pray that you uh, would fall upon us in a fresh way and communicate this again and again through late night study early morning classes, in the middle of the day, and in the summer months ahead, we invite you to ask of us something great.